Hello and welcome to another episode of Latitude. And in this episode, we are looking at what really came out of two very high-profile meetings that were hosted by India as part of India's presidency this year of the G20. This was the G20 finance minister meeting and followed very quickly by the G20 foreign ministers meeting. And in both, one of the headlines which continued to repeat itself was that there was a lack of consensus. What the lack of consensus means and does it mean that we achieve nothing out of these meetings or at least something of substance was achieved will be explained by our two experts. We have with us Ambassador Sachanar, who is the president of the Global Studies Institute and the executive council member of the IDSA. And we have Pramit Pal Chaudhary, a very respected commentator on world affairs, earlier with the Hindustan Times and now a fellow of the Ananta Aspen Center and the South Asia head of the Euroasia Group. And I'll start with you, Ambassador Sachin Haas, sir. Prime Minister Modi, in one of his addresses to this group, post-pandemic economic recovery of the world, how the world should address terrorism, because that's a subject that at least impacts on us extensively, or is this becoming now an excuse amongst countries not to move forward and commit their money into projects because they say unless the world is fully sorted out and conflict-free, we are not able to do anything? Your view, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Maruf. Uh, I don't think it's an excuse. I don't think we can really say it's an excuse. And I would, uh, to begin with, tend to agree with you that, of course, as far as the Russia-Ukraine conflict is concerned, that is the most serious of the divisions that we see that is, you know, the latest of them all. There are many others that you have recounted, uh, which have been with us uh, for quite some time, you know, whether it is uh, the uh, U.S.-China uh, trade war, we have seen that uh, uh, there has been a ban on export of uh, uh, sensitive technologies from the United States. We have seen uh, China's assertive and uh, expansionist policies in the South China Sea. We have seen its intimidatory policies as far as Taiwan is concerned. We have seen the issue of uh, terrorism you mentioned, climate change you mentioned. And these are all uh, uh, issues that the world needs to contend with, that the world needs to deal with. And uh, in that context, uh, as you mentioned uh, very correctly, you know, G20 represents uh, a, a very good forum because it represents about 85% of the world GDP, 75% of world trade, etc. But in addition to that, Maruf, to all countries in the world. Maruf. Okay, so very comprehensively, Puksa. And uh, we'll come back to that, particularly with reference to uh, a major global institution, the UN and what has it done and what can it do more? Uh, Pramit, uh, we were talking just before the start of the show and that you are quite optimistic about what the G20 uh, top ministers have been able to achieve consensus or no consensus. But as you said, that there is more than 90% consensus on a lot of issues. Now, what I need to understand is if there was so much of consensus, then why was the absence of consensus being highlighted all the time in the media? Why wasn't the good news trickling down to all of us? Well, partly because the Ukraine war obviously is top of the mind, both for anybody in media and anybody who's looking at the world today. War, by definition, uh, has to be top of the mind. Uh, and, that, and as the ambassador mentioned, there are a number of other fissures, a U.S.-China relationship, uh, which is going down a hill quite, uh, quite rapidly. Uh, and then there's the issue of the global south, a number of neglected issues or the a sense among the poorer countries that they've been neglected, especially over the past five years during the COVID pandemic, uh, in the green transition issue, and now the in problem of food and fuel inflation. So these were they, those were there. The key, key point, though, is that was not 
that is automatically going to be played up because those are what the governments will will yell about. War is is by definition page one news. But what the government has been focused on at the G20 is much more long-term, less sexy issues, if you wish. Now, at the heart of it, and as as the foreign minister, because the green transition, for example, in India, will require by most estimates for us to get to net zero emissions, something like $4 trillion minimum in foreign capital, I mean, what are beyond what we can raise domestically. That is not going to come from governments. That has to come from the private sector. But the private sector is nervous to come to India. So can we readjust the international system, the IMF, World Bank, the Bretton Woods system, to make it easier to what finance guys would say, de-risk private capital flows coming in to the emerging economies and to at least uh, to the LDCs? So that in many ways is, I would say, the number one issue. And the government was able to get agreement on at least the principles involved, the actual structure of still has to be worked out, and that's going to be part of the game till September. Then there's a whole set of standards in technology regarding green transition, green hydrogen. There are now 14 different green hydrogen standards, but this is going to be a problem. If an Indian steel company decides to buy green hydrogen of one standard and then finds that a country that it exports to doesn't accept that standard, then they can't export their steel or they face a massive tariff. This is a huge trade problem. Our automobile, a lot of our automobile, 40% of our automobiles are exported. So it goes on and on. Those are the issues that in many ways in the long run are going to be more important for countries like India. Those don't get headlines. So the government of India is focused on slowly getting that difficult issue of getting these issues through the geopolitical fissures or around them. Okay, so well put. Well put. The thing is that we have to move. I've personally been of the view that since the world and the world body, the UN and the rest, have been able to do nothing to curtail Russia's military agenda, what should the world do? Should the world look at a new architecture? Should the world look at new terms by which the world can again divide itself further between what the rich 18 odd countries wish to do and leave the other two or three out and say, you sort yourself out and your house out before we'll incorporate you further. Does this mean the G20 needs a regrouping and rearrangement? Because clearly the lines have been divided. Does it mean the UN needs to be revisited and rearranged? What is this? What is the real stumbling block in the world moving together, at least amongst the rich countries, if we are going to talk of some kind of an agenda for the future? Yeah, you know, in this, uh, what uh, the Prime Minister also mentioned when he addressed the foreign ministers virtually was that he said multilateralism is in crisis because, you know, both the mandates, the objectives for which the multilateral institutions were established after the Second World War, that is one to maintain peace and uh, tranquility, and the other is to foster cooperation. On both the issues, the uh, multilateral system has uh, stumbled. So we need to have what uh, we have called a reformed multilateralism. You would recall that in the wake of the COVID-19 also, Prime Minister Modi had made a call for reformed multilateralism, basically saying that the same systems are being used to govern the global architecture of relations, uh, which were put in place in 1945 after the Second World War. But the world has changed very significantly, whether it is in political cloud, strength, prosperity, et cetera. So there has to be a change in multilateralism. And that uh, that uh, forms a part of the uh, declaration that came out of the foreign minister's meeting that we need to have a reform and a reinvigorated multilateralism in addition to a large number of other issues that were taken up. Okay, so we look at the other issues after a break and also we look at what India can count as its significant contribution as the president of the G20. We've got only a few months left. Let's hope we can do a little more than hold hosting conferences. But that after a break. Make really a dent in the approach of the powerful and the rich nations towards the global issues. And Pramit, I'm going to come to you and try and ask you to help me understand 
you know, there is the G20, which makes all the headlines. As you say, the world expects them to chart the agenda. But there's the rest of the world. And India is speaking up. Prime Minister Modi has also indicated the need for us to take everybody along. So the biggest fallout of the Ukraine conflict is not Europe is is not that Europe is feeling insecure, is the energy crisis. There is a big energy petroleum crisis, and I'm told something close to 141 countries are now teetering on going into the financial red, as it were. And it's going to have an impact on food. It's going to have an impact on lifestyles. So... What can be done by the G20, which wasn't done in these two conferences, to address the energy-centric issues? Because the G20 seems to me to be only concerned about them and their citizens. Well, that's as you rightly <laughs> rightly said, India has been raising the, quote, global south uh, as a specific agenda within uh, the G20. And this arises from the fact that when Indian diplomats have spoken uh, to other parts of the world, they've seen a lot of anger in Africa, in the Middle East, in maybe some of the last smaller Latin American, Caribbean countries. Uh, they feel a degree of neglect. And it's not just the Ukraine war. It actually goes back to, I would say, the COVID period when they were largely abandoned uh, by almost everybody in terms of vaccines and medicine. Uh, then it was followed uh, by uh, the green transition when everybody in the world started to say, now we move to solar and wind. About over 50 out of 55 African countries uh, depend on fossil fuels. And they said, OK, well, how do we switch to solar? We have a lot of sun. And everybody basically said, well, just go do it on yourself. And they said, we can't afford it. Well, tough. Nobody's going to buy your coal. Nobody's going to buy your oil. Uh, and uh, the cost of that transition will have to be effectively born by yourself, which most of them cannot do. Uh, and then the Ukraine war takes place and adds on to existing problems in the energy, uh, energy area, dragging up prices. And as you mentioned, food is a big issue because gas prices went, were the ones that really were affected the most. And because Russia is, is, is a huge gas provider and gas is very strongly linked to fertilizer prices, which in turn, therefore, drive food. Um, so India has tried to work out something. One is, I think the core of that is just to get people to recognize there's a problem. When I've talked to Indian officials, they say just getting the West to recognize that fertilizer, which everybody sort of assumed is not a problem, uh, that that is a genuine problem for the global South uh, was, a, was an issue. The second part is to go in and say that, look, we saw what happened in Sri Lanka. We see what's happening in Pakistan. We now see what's happened in Ghana and a few other countries which have defaulted on their debt. And they have this problem that if you if you are you are dependent upon importing energy uh, at dollar prices, automatically prices go up, your dollar reserves go down, your currency collapses, yeah. and then you go back into another vicious cycle. So the government of India has proposed a, a debt swap arrangement where the richest central banks of the world <clears throat> agree to back the currencies of the poorest countries. You know, India has been doing a tightrope walk. And despite being the host of these two important summits, people say 90-95% uh, of issues were addressed. There has been a communique that has come out, which generally talks about all the good news. But to me, uh, post Ukraine, China, Russia have really gone into a bind. They are now a combined two elephant and bear in the room as against all of the others who are pussyfooting around. So what are we looking at in terms of the G20 being able to achieve something or is the G20 like the UN going to become a glorified talking shop? Okay, uh, let me respond to this. You know, uh, G20, as you said right at the beginning, Maruf, deals with economic issues. It deals with financial issues. Now, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is neither economic nor financial. But so it, it has, not, but it, if I, I mean, I agree. I'm, it has I'm, solid economic in, impact I'm, I'm on the that. energy and that. food markets. I'm coming to that, uh, Maruf, because, you know, this is exactly what the Prime Minister said, that issues on which we can agree 
we should go forward and not allow issues on which there is lack of agreement to Very put well. obstacles in the way of those items. Very so well. I think what we have been able to do, Marov, in this case of G20 is that on all the issues, economic issues, financial issues, and I would dare say some of the issues that are not economic or financial, like counter-narcotics, terrorism, etc., they have also been included. You know, all the issues which are a part of our uh, priorities, whether it is uh, on climate change, on life for, uh, 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 you know, they, there was no agreement, was on the issue of Russia-Ukraine conflict, which, as I have mentioned, it is not supposed to be a part of the remit of G20. Very so well I clarified, sir. Very well. And I'm, I, I am grateful to you for this clarification. Because what happens is, boom, phirke, everyone is stymied by the Russia-Ukraine conflict. <laughs> Ramit, I want last question to you. Now, help us understand that where all could India make a serious dent in the geopolitical narrative that is there, using the G20 as a platform, other than being the organizers of these so many conferences, because there are challenges in the world like terrorism. There are challenges in the world in terms of stabilizing energy prices and matters like that. So the G20, remember, we only chair this once every 20 years, right? So we're not going to chair this again uh, for almost another generation. So this is a one-off. So this is not about us being able to maintain a sustained diplomatic effort. All we are trying to do is get the G, the, the biggest countries, the, the richest, most powerful countries in the world, to keep their mind on certain issues in the economic field, but largely in this case on climate, um, that you guys need to be focused on these. And then when we hand this over to, for example, Brazil, who takes over the chair, we all hope that in our conversations, I know we're already holding them with the Brazilians, that this is then sustained after we walk out. It doesn't necessarily have to be that the G20 takes this up on its own. We could then come out and say, okay, we've got an agreement, for example, on green finance. And of the G20 countries, we can see that 12 of them are still very interested. And so then we can spin this off and go our own route on green finance with those 12 countries. Saudi Arabia is not going to be overly excited by green finance. That's not their area, right? Uh, so, but we can work with. And we know. I know the Amer. We know the Americans and the European Union are very excited by the green finance idea. This is something that's very top of their mind. So we can go and do that. Biofuels. We're proposing a biofuels global alliance. Everybody else is nobody's paying attention. Brazil, America, some of the African countries are running to us and say, "Hey." This is very good. It fits in very nicely with what we have in mind. So after the G20, we may continue to pursue this with them. But we set that, get that stamp of international approval, put it on page one, if you wish, on the international agenda. And then after that, we see what we can do with that. Okay, very well put. And, and you know, I might just like to add the last word that for India, one of the achievements was to get some of the most important policymakers in the world, finance ministers and foreign ministers, to come to Delhi and both Mr. Jay Shankar and Mrs. Sitaraman did not lose out on the big picture for India by engaging with them on however short the bilateral engagements were, but to get an opportunity at one forum to engage with so many top policymakers and to get a kind of geostrategic understanding of what are their concerns under the current circumstances and where they have expectations from India, I think would be a big takeaway for both North and South Bloc. But until then, thank you very much. Thank you.